One of my favorite things about carving spoons is that I can pick up a piece of wood basically off the forest floor or just from the top of a tree that maybe I've cut down for some other purpose. And I can start and finish a project in a very short period of time. Because I'm working this from trees and from green wood, I think it's one of the best exercises in breaking your way into looking at green wood as a functional, usable material. It just opens up all sorts of avenues because all of a sudden you look at every tree as a potential resource and you'll, you look at every branch that comes out and say, oh, that'd make a great ladle and that would make a great this. It's that direct connect that I think is, is really fantastic in spoon carving. The first split that I go to make on the log is basically down the pith and perpendicular to where the branch is. So wherever the branch grows out, I need to be perpendicular to that so I can basically take the log in half. That's going to both reveal where the center pith point of the branch is, and it's also going to get rid of a lot of material that I don't need any longer. Depending on the size of it, I can do that splitting with a chisel, I can do it with my fro, or if it's larger, I do it with a, a, a wedge and a sledgehammer. The toolkit for carving spoons can be pretty rudimentary, which is one of the things that I find very refreshing about it. That being said, there are some specialty tools that I really like to use, such as the Sloyd knife. I also use the hook knife to clean out the bowls. I've also used the bandsaw, especially with these hardwoods, that really speeds the process along. You know, I don't think you should be ashamed of any tool if it's gonna get the job done. Where the branch grows into the trunk, you have fibers coming in in different directions, but they literally weave into each other and they cross over each other in such a way that they form this incredibly strong joint. You can't split along there because you've got sort of a crosshatch of fibers. So the first thing I need to do is sever those fibers at the trunk. I have to saw across the trunk portion. The hatchet is really handy, mainly for hewing and a little paring, but mainly for hewing, which means I take a series of strokes that are gonna cut cross grain, creating sort of a weak layer at the bottom of those strokes, at the depth of those, and then I come down across all those chips that I've created, sloughing them off. And it's an ancient process. It's how the ax used to be used to square up beams, and that's the main use of it. The draw knife is very handy because I use it to sort of clean up and create a planer piece of wood out of a very organic one. It gives me my, my first real decent flats on both the back and the front of the piece. And once I have it on the front and I've carved away that bark, then I'm gonna have a nice surface to draw the shape of the spoon that I intend to build. The shave horse is not essential equipment to this. You could do it in just a vise, but the shave horse always does a little bit better than the vise as far as flexibility. With something like a spoon, there is no front really, there is no back, and every side has to be beautiful and addressed. So I find the shave horse a really easy way to be able to address each part of the spoon, moving it around fluidly without having an issue. Once I have the basic outline of the spoon drawn on there, I want to waste away as much material as possible, just to get it out of my way. So the hatchet is really great for that, so is the draw knife. On the harder woods, it's far easier on your body to hog out the different portions of the bowl with a gouge and then go back in with the hook knife. What I try to do is get as much of the wood out of the way as I can, but then when it comes time to start really thinking about shape, that's when I switch over to the far more controllable Sloyd and hook knife. When you're using a Sloyd, the best workbench is your lap and your body, basically. There's a lot of different positions you can use it with a lot of control. The longer blades are great because you can slice as you're taking these strokes and you can hold the, the sloyd and the spoon in such a way that you get very powerful long slicing strokes say to, to carve down the handle or you can also use sort of a, a scissor type stroke where you use your body and lever off of your thumb while holding the bowl of the uh, spoon to, to carve the back of the bowl and get a lot of power you can really pull off a lot of wood quite easily especially with green wood and especially if you're using a softer wood. The hook knife is very good, especially if the wood's soft, but the hook knife is wonderful for tuning up those surfaces. It's just that, that curved shape 
just maps itself and it normally has a variable curve so you can use it in all sorts of different portions of the bowl and just nothing can reach into those spaces and follow those arcs quite as well as a hook knife. I tend to recommend you use softwoods, especially in the beginning, like birch, which is going to carve beautifully. It's going to cut really cleanly, especially when it's green. But I actually tend to use harder woods, like apple wood or maple, which I find give me spoons that can be made incredibly thin. And they can become so light, thin, but it's strong at the same time. It can be very refined, and, and they can be incredibly durable. Those harder woods that tend to be a little more difficult to work, they take more effort, but I like the longevity of those spoons. I make all my spoons out of green wood, every last one. And so drying them is a big part of the process. Once the wood is dry, now my cuts are different than before. Before I wanted them not to tear out, but I was really going for shape over surface. And in the end, I'm mainly going for surface because the shape will already be there. What I'm trying to do is to make those facets not only tell the shape, but they should also be very even and have a nice sharp glow to them. I'm just looking for the finest cuts I can get because that's tactically very rewarding when you're using the piece or even just looking at it. A lot of spoon carving comes from when the materials are available. So if I've taken a tree down for chairs, which is generally why I would take it down, and I see a lot of nice branches at the top, you know, that used to be waste and now it's a very exciting part of my repertoire. I can take those and make spoons out of them. I tend to do it either sitting at night. I used to sit by the fire and just carve spoons, and in summer I sit on the back porch and carve spoons. It's just, it's a, it's a very meditative thing to do. If, if ever you're watching somebody do it, you'll find that they could care less what you're doing. And if you try and pull them away, they would rather take one more cut, and that one more cut goes on for hours. It's a very addictive way of working wood, and it's just a very engaged and immediate way of working it. And once you've made one successful spoon, there's no way to stop.